sundry times, and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he had by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he said, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he said, Who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he said, Thy throne, O God, is for ever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, and thou remainest. And they all shall wax old, as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest <coughs> to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? May God let his blessing for that further reading of his word grant us all understanding. So we now to the book of the prophet Jeremiah, <coughs> chapter 31, verse 19. Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 19. These words, surely after the time was turned, I repented. And after that I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. Your subject is turning life round. That's what this passage is all about. There is a background picture. In fact, there are two uh, background pictures in these verses. One is the picture of an untamed bullock, a male calf, not yet trained, gallivanting about wherever it wants to go, a law unto itself, and the bullock is chastised. And the other background picture, a more than background, is a picture of Israel, the northern kingdom. Now, Israel is no more. At the time of the prophet Jeremiah, Israel has gone into captivity. It no longer exists, the ten northern tribes as they were. 
So what are they doing here in a prophecy? Well, they are implanting a figure or a picture of millions who will yet turn to God and repent of their sin. And why is Israel selected as a picture of conversion or of repentance? Well, because they were so impossible. They were so obstinately against God. They refused to turn, no matter what God did and how he appealed to them and how many prophets he sent them. Yet they would not have him. And ultimately, the patience of God after many centuries reached its end, as it were, and they went off into captivity and were dispersed and were no more as a nation. But they come back in these prophecies. Because they were a figure, they were a picture of millions of people who would, in the remaining history of the world, repent from equal stubbornness and spiritually lost situations. So I'd like us to look at these remarkable verses. Conversion is always the same. Throughout the Bible, it's always the same. It's a matter of being brought to our senses, convinced of our spiritual need, shown our sinfulness so that we are ashamed, brought to see the goodness of God in salvation and how he's provided for us, so that we repent of our sins and we see our need of the grace of God alone to save us and we yield to him and then he transforms us and changes us and gives us new life. And wherever you go in the scripture, the way back to God is always described, probably in the same terms. And this is a tremendous example. So we have to look at it. First of all, then, the book. Look at verse 18. I have surely heard Ephraim, that's the northern tribes, lost Israel, bemoaning himself thus. Israel Ephraim is now a picture of repentant people. And she's lamenting. Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised. As a bullock, unaccustomed to the yoke, untrained, turn thou me, and I shall be turned. For thou art the Lord my God. What a change for the illustration of Israel. Ephraim, that was the name of one of the tribes, but the name of the biggest. So it's often put for the whole of Israel. The most stubborn of them all, and yet depicted here in the language of the prophets as a people who have repented and turned back to God. An untrained book, just wild, running here and there, anything that attracts its attention, anything that interests it. Of course, all its interests and pursuits are ultimately futile, but nevertheless, it goes after them with great vigour and great uh, eagerness. And that's a picture of us also. On the one hand, a rebellious nation who would not respond to any of God's appeals to it. On the other hand, an untrained book, ignorant, unaware, just chasing after sensations and impulses and momentary attractions. And that's how we're described before we come to God. There are many things influence us. We are so easily influenced, like that bullet, anything that interests it. Social factors influence us. Friends influence us. All kinds of things presented to our attention. Excite us, consume us. And off we go, charging after one thing or another, that's the picture. And yet such a person, we can be converted to God. We can see the deeper meaning of life and its ultimate purpose. And we can be turned to him from rebellion and wild escapades to seek the living God. The greatest influence in our lives is our self-view. How we see ourselves. You may not consciously think about this, but how you see yourself governs really your approach to life and your attitude to the living God. We generally take the place of God. That's how we see ourselves. 
You've never articulated this. <coughs> You've never said this. But our trouble is, we see ourselves as gods. We consider ourselves to be our own god. That's the reality. So, for example, it works like this. It is as though we say, I am my own god and I am sovereign. I am sovereign in my life. I decide what I do. I value my self-determination. I do whatever I want. When if I'm young, when I look into the future, I aim to do whatever pleases me, whatever takes my delight and interest. I will live as I want to live. I will do what I want to do. You call it sin if you like. But if I want to do it, I will do it. Actually, it's a way of saying, I am my own God, I am sovereign in my life. I will determine what I do. We start thinking like this from a very young age. We can be quite small, and it's what I want, it's what I aim to do. I have taken the place of God in my own life. That's our trouble, how we view ourselves. And like God, we say, well, again, we wouldn't necessarily say it, articulate it, but this is how we think. I am self-sufficient. I, I am capable. I can do and achieve and accomplish whatever I want. I don't need to pray. Don't talk to me about God. I don't need that. I don't need prayer. I don't need to depend upon Him or any agency outside myself. I don't need to obey him as a condition for getting his help. I am sufficient. I have my dreams, I have my plans, I have my ideas, and I can do it. So on the one hand we're sovereign, then at the same time we're self-sufficient. It's very proud, but it never occurs to us how proud we are. We're confident and self-sufficient. Only God is self-sufficient. Only God needs no power outside his own. Only God needs no food, no air to breathe, no clothing to put on, no energy source. But we think of ourselves as though we're God. I can do it. I am self-sufficient so and not If we analyze our actions and our thoughts, if we don't come to God and we've no time for him, that's how we're thinking. I am sovereign. I'm self-sufficient. I am able. And then, amazingly, it's almost as though we say, I am a creator. Of course, again, you'd never say it, but it is as though this is what you think. I'm self-made. I never think of, if, if I've got a good memory, it never occurs to me, God gave me that. If I'm good at maths, or I've got a gift in business, or particular strength, or athletic capability, Whatever may be your particularly strong point, maybe it never occurs to me. God gave me that. Oh no, it's as though I created myself. I am the owner of everything about me. I am the possessor. I behave as though I achieved this. I accomplished this. I brought this about. So without actually claiming it or saying it, we behave as though we're our own creator. That's the trouble with us. And we dream great things that we can't possibly be sure of or accomplish. We can't govern the circumstances of life. We don't know the course life's journey will take, the misfortunes and the difficulties. But we behave like a creator, as though we have power to shape it. <coughs> and we made ourselves. And then we behave as though we are to be worshipped. Are these astonishing claims? But it's true, you never dare say it. But we behave when we're away from God as though we should be worshipped. We live to be admired for what people think of us, to be applauded, to be regarded, to be well thought of, to be loved. Only God is the object of worship. And here we are strutting through life as objects to be worshipped by others and applauded and appreciated and esteemed. We behave like gods. It's astonishing. 
when we're away from Him. It's how we are. And then only God is wise. But if we're rebels against God, we think we're wise. We're very opinionated. Well, this is an opinionated age, isn't it? With social media and so on. Opinions, opinions. The air is thick with opinions. I say this, I say that, I think this, I think that. Everybody's very quick to give their opinions and give their judgments and their criticisms. Why we think we're so wise when we're away from God. And we're dogmatic. We are right and we'll argue the points. And that's our trouble really when you analyse it. We're behaving like God. We're behaving as though we think we are our own God. And God owns everything. But no, if you're a rebel against God, you are very possessive. I own my territory, my property, whatever it is. I'm acquisitive. I want to get things. I'm possessive when I've got them. So possessive. We're behaving like God. And uh, Augustine, some 1700 years ago now, famously said, even in our sin, we seek to imitate God. Well, you can't, of course, but we imitate Him in that we appoint ourselves our own gods. Have you ever looked at it like that? That's how we are. So proud, gods to ourselves, with so much to repent of. I'll spend some time speaking about that. Come back to the illustration. And here it is in verse 18 or verse 19 I'll read from. Verse 19, shortly after that, I was turned, I repented, and after that I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh. Oh, dear friends, Ephraim laments. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself. Thus, what an interesting word, old-fashioned word, bemoaning himself. It uh, literally in the Hebrew says, he shook his head. He became so sad when he looked at himself. Here's Israel, Ephraim, a nation, depicted as shaking its head with amazement at how he lived and what he'd done and how he behaved. And then he says, I was chastised. And there seems to be a problem in the words. I was chastised. God chastised me. But I was like an untamed bullock, thrashing about, obstinate, beaten maybe with a stick, shied away, wouldn't return. The initial picture is that when first chastised, we were, ob we were obstinate and we won't respond. And that's true. Maybe God chastises by sending an illness or turning our world upside down so that all our hoped for achievements, the bottom falls out of them. Things go wrong. Maybe in friendships, things go radically wrong and we start to receive knocks as though we're being chastised. Think, think. Don't behave as though you're a God. Think about the living God and that you owe your life to him and he made you. But we won't respond. We're like that untamed bullet. But then the passage goes on to say, and I was chastised. Eventually, it worked. What made the difference? How was it that there was severe chastisement, punishment, or hard things came into a life, and it didn't seem to work, and then suddenly it did work? Well, the clue is in the passage. Is Ephraim, my dear son, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore my bowels, my innermost heart is troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him. Here's what made the difference. Here's how God deals with somebody who's going to come to him and going to be converted, going to walk with the Lord and know him. Yes, there are some hard things to go through and they probably won't work because of our stubbornness and our sinfulness and our unbelief. But then God shows us his kindness. 
Now, I'm going to read to you an old hymn of John Newton. And he was a slave trader, seaman, and he was uh, converted in the year 1748 at the age of 23. That's a very long time ago. But here's how he puts it. In evil long I took delight, unawed by shame or fear, till a new wonder shocked my sight and stopped my wild career. I'll tell you what actually happened. He had many impressions on his heart that he was far away from God and he was engaging, indulging in every kind of sin, in his slave trading ways, but he was unmoved, unaffected, and then there were difficulties. He was a prisoner for some considerable time. He was betrayed. He had everything stolen from him. He had knock after knock, and still he wouldn't see that he was away from God and life would never work out without repentance and trust in the living God. Then he was involved in a mighty storm at sea and there was certain death ahead of him the most violent storm imaginable. And yet even that didn't at first turn him until he remembered something. He remembered about Christ. He remembered the lessons that he learned at his mother's knee about Christ the Saviour, about his coming from heaven to earth and suffering and dying on a cross in great love to take the punishment of sin due to all who would be saved. And he remembered these things. And in the midst of the height of a storm, it was this that broke through to his soul and made him realize the love of God and his own sinfulness and rejection of God, the amazing kindness and mercy of God. Listen to this, in evil long I took delight, unawed by shame or fear, Till a new wonder shocked my sight and stopped my wild career. I saw one hanging on a tree in agonies and blood who fixed his loving eyes on me as near his cross I stood. Never until my latest breath can I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. My conscience felt and owned the guilt and fell to deep despair. I saw my sins his blood had spilt and helped to nail him there. Another look he gave which said, I freely all forgive. This blood has for your ransom paid. I died <coughs> that you may live. Thus while his death my sin displays in all its ugly hue, such is the wonder of his grace it seals my pardon too. That's what moved him, and that's what is referred to in this passage. The untamed bullock is whipped and chastised. The unruly nation is cast into a furnace of trouble and trouble and difficulty and won't repent our stubbornness. I won't turn to God. I'm going to carry on being my own God. And then comes our view of Christ, the love of God in Christ, who came to earth and suffered and died for a wretched rebel like me, and shed his blood and took the torment and the agony of my punishment upon himself, so that I could be forgiven. And that breaks my heart, and that causes me to be ashamed of my sin. That's how God intervenes. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus, Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised. As a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke, turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. Dear friends, this is how it works. We say to ourselves, I see it all. What a fool I've been. I see what a weak creature I am. I see I'm a sinner. I see I cannot ever deserve the goodness of God. 
and I cannot earn salvation. I cannot improve. My record is terrible. I have offended God. I am selfish. I am arrogant. I am rebellious. I am wayward. I am proud. I am all these things. I forfeited eternal life. I will one day come under the judgment of a holy God. I have despised holy things. I have loved sinful things and earthly things. I have despised God and I have dealt with him appallingly. I have sinned against light and conscience. I heard the gospel even perhaps. I knew the truth and I trampled on it and pushed it away from me. And now I see that there is Christ the Saviour who can forgive me and who can receive me nevertheless. But I know I need the grace of God. He must change me. He must cleanse me. He must make me a new person. Turn thou to me, says the repenting Ephraim, and give me a new nature and a new direction. God must do it. Of course, the atoning death of Christ alone makes this possible. Do you understand that? Does everybody know about the atoning death of Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, who came into this world and assumed a human body and personality and suffered and died on a cross so that he could bear himself to the wrath of the Father who poured out upon him that eternity of just punishment for sin that was ours if we are those who repent of our sin and depend upon him. Do you know about that? Do you understand that, dear friends? You know nothing about life or eternity or God if you don't understand about the atoning substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, equal with the Father. Oh, friends, if you don't know that, you have no hope and you know nothing. You must say to him, I will no longer be my own God. I will no longer seek to be sovereign in my life. Self-sufficient, as though I made myself, as though I can do what I like. I must no longer be an object of worship. Take myself wise. Be a possessor. I must be possessed by God. I must be under his sovereignty and lead and guidance. Oh, verse 19. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. And after that I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh. Look at the shame that came into repentance. I was ashamed, the Hebrew says, I sighed. I breathed in a deep sigh. I was so shocked at what I saw in my life and my resistance against God. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, humiliated, abased before God because I did bear the reproach of my youth was like a great weight upon me. Everything I've ever done, everything I've thought and said about God, all my rebellion against Him. That's how we feel when we repent. It's not a light matter. Some people make it a light matter. You just trip into the presence of God and you say, Lord, forgive me. He won't. Not unless we come into His presence and we say, and we feel it, Lord, I have sinned. I have been a rebel against thee. I have spurred thee. I have done unspeakable things. I know it. I am ashamed. I am that sinner who deserves to die. I am that sinner who deserves nothing but rejection. And you repent of your sin. And you ask for his mercy and grace. And he gives it. Oh, it's there at the end of verse 20. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. It's the atoning death of Christ that purchases salvation 
for us. And they will depend upon his power to give us a new nature, a new beginning, a new heart, a new attitude to life, a new desire to please him and to obey him. Repentance is described by that novelist of old, Captain Merritt, as a matter of burning over sin, yearning for salvation and turning to the Lord. And he coined the old prayer in sorrow and repentance true, Father, I trembling come to you. That's how you repent. That's how you approach the Lord and you ask for full forgiveness. I come to conclusion with verse 21. This is a mysterious verse. It's actually very easy. Set the up way marks, signposts. Make the high heaps, literally from the Hebrew, high heaps of stones, such as the ancient would make memorials. So, <coughs> signposts for yourself. Make memorials. Set thine heart toward the highway. You've repented of your sin. You've yielded to God. You've asked him to change you and turn you and make you new. And now you mark the day. You've set up a memorial. This was the month. This was the time of my life. This was the day when I turned to Jesus Christ and I bowed the knee to him. And I'll remember it always. And I'll set up signposts, that is to say, I'll keep my eyes on the road that leads to heaven, to him. From this day forward, I am for him, and I am with him, and I'm in his service. And I will pray to him to keep me on that road. And that's the great promise and undertaking and pledge and vow which the Lord moves you to make as you give yourself to him. So, here's the picture, here's how it works. I'm a wild, untamed bullock, or I'm a rebellious nation like Israel of old that would never turn to God. It would always have its own way. And then God comes to work in my life, and in some shape or form, he chastises me and pulls me up short. And it doesn't work, no matter what difficulties I run into. It doesn't work until God adds to that a picture of his love. And I see Christ dying on the cross of Calvary. And I see all the love of God. And I see that Jesus Christ was willing to do that for an evil person like me. And that finally breaks me. And I repent in shame. And I turn to him and I say, Lord, turn me. Change me. Make me anew. And he does. And he gives me a new heart and cleanses me. And then, in gratitude, and because I am now his, he has so worked in my life that I am permanently his. I am his forever and give myself wholly and unreservedly for to him. That's the picture in these verses. Chastise no effect. Then broken by the love of God. See the need for free salvation and God's power to change me. Repent with shame. And God receives me and I know him and I walk with him. And oh dear friends, we could go on, but our time is out. And we could look at verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. But now God is dealing with us in a new way. Verse 33. This shall be the covenant that I will make. After those days, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God. And they shall be my people. We know him. And we pray to him, and we prove him every day, and we love him and worship him, and he reveals his great kindness and his mighty power to us, day by day, to come to Christ, 
is to know him and to know him in an intimate and a personal way every day of your life. And that's what this is about, dear friends. And everywhere in the Bible, conversion is the same. Rebellion, chastisement, sight of Christ or his salvation, appeal to God for him to change us, desire it with all our hearts, repent of our sin, and know the new life which comes from God, which comes from Christ, and to prove him, and to walk with him to the end of the journey. Is that your experience? Where are you in this scheme of things? Where do you stand? Are you still an untamed bullock? Influenced by other people? Tossed about? Gadding about? As the old saying goes, with fruitless and empty things that dominate your life? Or have you been touched by the amazing love of God, by seeing Christ and his way of salvation and come to him? You must repent and yield to him and seek him with all your heart. Let's pray together. Young and old alike, O oh Lord, let not the time go by. Let not any slip away into condemnation and eternal darkness. O oh Lord, we pray that all here may come to seek and find Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour, and prove Him and love Him. O oh Lord, come and work in every heart and hear us and receive us, we ask. We ask it in the name of our Saviour, for his sake. Amen. Amen.